Imagine you're in a small, bell-shaped capsule a little larger than a refrigerator. Now imagine that capsule is bobbing like a cork in the Atlantic Ocean, with waves blotting out the sun through the small window above your head. You might feel claustrophobic, maybe even overheated as you power down the capsule and the cooling system running through your silver pressure suit. You know that it won't be long until you're able to taste fresh air again as the recovery choppers close in. And you would feel the sensation of fresh air in your face, but only after a sharp thud awakens you from your trance. Light pours into your glorified can, and with it the onrush of salt water. This is exactly what an American astronaut experienced on July 21st, 1961. Now there are many names well known through history books and schools alike, and I'm sure you've heard them too. Neil Armstrong, John Glenn, Buzz Aldrin. But many don't know about the second American who ventured into space, Air Force Captain Gus Grissom. Only the third human to ever cross into space behind Yuri Gagarin and Alan Shepard, Grissom's suborbital hop was a nearly flawless flight until moments before his capsule was recovered by helicopter. My channel normally deals in flight, but strap yourselves in gang because we're punching through the sky, into space, and back again as we follow Gus Grissom's fateful flight in Liberty Bell 7. The origins of the space race have been done to death in various videos, so I'll keep this part relatively short. And by relatively short, we just have to go back a couple thousand years. Modern humans have something very much in common with our caveman ancestors. We both looked up at the stars and moon at night. While of course we have a much better understanding now of celestial bodies, as far back as ancient China we've been trying to figure out ways to explore everything above us. In 2000 BC or so the legend goes, a Mandarin official named Wan Hu attempted to climb to the stars on a chair packed with black powder fired rockets. Honestly, this doesn't really make all that much sense, given gunpowder was invented almost 3,000 years later, but I digress. The point is, if he was real, he probably didn't make it into space, but points for trying. Modern space travel concepts really got rolling in the 19th century. Stories such as A Trip to the Moon by Jules Verne depicted American scientists, yeah, that's right, traveling to the moon by cramming themselves in a giant cannon round, which was then fired at the moon? Okay. Okay, so fast forward a bit, um, Robert Goddard, an American scientist, improved rocket designs, uh, and Germany went on a vacation from 1939 to 1945 when they developed the V-2 ballistic missile, I mean, the peaceful A-4 rocket designed for scientific exploration. <clears throat> After said vacation, many of the German scientists decided they wanted to move to the U.S. instead of the Soviet Union because White Sands missile range is better for tanning than the gulags of Siberia. Werner von Braun, notable nice guy who had no ties to the Algemeine SS or any form of forced labor in pursuit of his rocket development, helped Redstone Armory develop the PGM-11 Redstone, an intermediate-range ballistic missile designed to rain nukes on our red-aligned neighbors across the pond. In fact, if you go back through the development of the Redstone, it was an almost direct descendant of the V-2. On the other side of the world, the Soviet Union wanted to further their own rocket development, and with their own captured German scientists under the supervision of Sergei Korolev, came up with the R-7 missile. Both the East and West had military ambitions for the missiles, but not just to deliver nuclear payloads. The concept of satellites had been floating around for several years to improve communication, spy on the other side, and act as orbital platforms to drop nukes. Like rocks from a highway overpass. Hell, in World War II, von Braun even had the idea of putting men into space and setting them up in a giant rotating space station for military and scientific purposes. The thing looked like a giant wagon wheel and would have spun at a rate enough to generate artificial gravity. You could tell he was passionate about this idea into the 1950s too. I mean, just look at this old Disney show about spaceflight. Even though there's no apparent motion, everything in the orbit is hurtling around the Earth at 16,000 miles per hour. The shell of the station is completed. Ah oh, man, Disney used to be so cool. Anyway. On October 4th, 1957, the Soviets, admittedly, beat us to space with their first satellite, Sputnik 1. This beach ball sized satellite didn't really do anything so much as prove that they could put an object in orbit, as Sputnik only operated as a radio transmitter, pumping out a consistent and incessant communist beeping.
A lot of people suggest that this is the moment where the space race really started, as America and the Soviets kept putting up more complex satellites, some of them containing animals, several of which didn't come home. As the world's attention turned to spaceflight, the question in everyone's mind was, when would we send a man up? And hell, what would we even call him? Established in 1958, the fledgling National Air and Space Administration, better known as NASA, began Project Mercury, a program aimed at putting an American in orbit. The big question at the time was what kind of people would be sent into space? Daredevils? Scientists? NASA determined that the right kind of person they would need to bear the risk was a military test pilot, with good reason too, as test pilots are already accustomed to danger, complex technology, and they have an excellent grasp on the fundamentals of aviation. In December of that year, NASA's Space Task Group coined the term astronaut for the new type of pilot, a contraction of aeronaut for air traveler and astro for stars. Star traveler. The first seven astronauts were handpicked from a pool of Air Force, Marine, and Navy pilots. On April 9th, Scott Carpenter, Gordon Cooper, John Glenn, Gus Grissom, Wally Schirra, Alan Shepard, and Deke Slayton were publicly announced to be the initial team of astronauts sent into space. Throughout 1959 and 1960, the astronauts trained relentlessly for every eventuality, practicing in-flight emergencies, water evacuations, and worse, how to handle the American news media. You see, the American space program was very different from the Soviet space program. Instead of being a state secret in which anonymity of the pilot was vital to cover up any possible accidents, NASA's program put a spotlight on the Mercury 7 to gain nationwide interest. Interest builds capital, after all. By the way, join my Discord. By 1961, it was decided that the first two space flights would be undertaken in modified Redstone missiles as suborbital hops to test if man could even function in space for a short 15-minute flight. Hell, if Ham the Chimpanzee could do it as he did on January 31st, 1961, why couldn't a test pilot? Of course, what would America's first Star Voyagers ride in? Okay, so first off, I want to make something very clear. That is a spacecraft, sir. We do not refer to it as a capsule. Spacecraft. The Mercury spacecraft, manufactured by the McDonnell Aircraft Corporation, was a bell-shaped cone large enough for a single occupant. The astronaut would lie on his back toward the bottom of the craft, where a composite heat shield lay. This would shield the spacecraft and astronaut from the intense friction that builds up during re-entry into the atmosphere. The nose of the craft was equipped with an escape tower that would be jettisoned after reaching space, radio equipment, and a parachute, among other various gadgets. Boosted into a suborbital hop by the Redstone, the initial mission profile of the Mercury was to rotate 180 degrees so the pilot could observe the Earth and conduct maneuvering tests with vernier boosters positioned around the craft. At the Mercury's apogee of 116 miles up, the spacecraft would engage a retro rocket package that would slow it down to a rate where gravity would do the rest. The Mercury was designed to perform a water landing, or splashdown, where the spacecraft and crew could be recovered either by helicopter or ship. But how would the astronaut get out? The initial Mercury design featured two forms of egress. The primary method was a hatch to the astronaut's side which opened via a lug system. The emergency escape system on the Block 1 spacecraft was through the nose. The control panel would have to be unbolted and moved aside to access an emergency escape hatch from which the astronaut would push the parachute casing through the narrow recovery ring. The astronauts, with Grissom at the helm, pushed for an explosive bolt system to be installed in the primary hatch. In an emergency, the astronaut would remove a safety wire and hit a plunger that would detonate a series of 70 explosive bolts and jettison the hatch in less than a second. He would then escape the craft with ease. Of course, this is under the taut cable of a helicopter, but we'll get to that. The first manned flight of Mercury Redstone was planned for early 1961, but a booster test on March 28th pushed the flight back to April 25th. Regardless, Alan Shepard was to take the reins. April 12th, 1961. Vostok 1 with cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin lifted off from Baikonur Cosmodrome. The Soviets elected to cover up the first manned spaceflight while it took place, unless they get egg on their faces if it failed. Gagarin performed several orbits of the Earth, and after nearly dying in a re-entry malfunction where the service module of the Vostok capsule didn't properly separate from the crew capsule, he somehow landed safely in Soviet territory and was made a hero. 
Okay, Yuri had some nuts doing this. I'm not trying to take anything away from him. The point is, the Soviets beat the US, as much as I hate to admit it. Needless to say, the Mercury 7 was raging to go, and on the 25th of April, Mercury Redstone 3, dubbed Freedom 7, was set to launch. The second manned flight into space went off without a hitch. Shepard's suborbital hop, while a far cry from the Soviet's orbital flight, was successful, paving the way for the upgraded Mercury to make a flight of its own in preparation for the more complex NASA missions. Grissom, chosen for Mercury Redstone 4, readied himself for launch on July 21st of 1961. His mission was simple, launch from Cape Canaveral, achieve an apogee of over 100 miles, and return to Earth while ensuring the revised Mercury capsule would be suitable for the orbital flights the rest of the 7 would undertake. Mercury capsule number 11, fresh off McDonald's production line in St. Louis, Missouri, was placed atop the mighty Redstone rocket and transported to Launch Complex 5. Grissom adorned Capsule 11 with a white crack paint scheme and the name Liberty Bell 7 to echo the motif of American values that Freedom 7 had. The thing did look like a bell, after all. At 1220 UTC, Liberty Bell 7, with Grissom at the controls, shot into the sky. Ignition. Lift off. Lift off. Liberty Bell 7 performed its mission flawlessly, albeit with Grissom taking a moment to experience the beauty of spaceflight that until then only two others had seen. As Liberty Bell fell from her apogee, Grissom experienced over 10 Gs of force, 10 times the force of gravity. As the spacecraft entered the atmosphere and began to slow, the McDonald built rivets held, the heat shield kept Grissom from cooking alive, and the parachute popped alive, slowing the bell. Main chute is good. Main chute is good. Rated descent coming down. Coming down to 40 feet per second. Off the Florida coast, the aircraft carrier USS Randolph launched Marine Seahorse helicopters in anticipation for recovery. The lead helicopter callsign Hunt Club 1 was piloted by Jim Lewis, who spotted the spacecraft in the air under parachute. As it approached the sea, Liberty Bell deployed a landing bag, a perforated curtain dangling from the bottom of the spacecraft. Not only would it help cushion the impact, it would then act as a sea anchor to help keep the bell vertical amidst the churning waves. Splashdown went without a hitch, and Liberty Bell's whip antenna deployed successfully, improving communications with the recovery team. The recovery process for Mercury spacecraft was a bit more complex than simply clamping on a cable. First, the whip antenna had to be severed by the helicopter's crew chief, who would then run a pole out to a recovery loop on the spacecraft's upper ring. At the tip of the pole was a carabiner that would snap onto the recovery loop and allow the seahorse to lift the craft several feet out of the water. When safely above the waves, the hatch would be opened, a good opportunity to test the explosive bolts. As Hunt Club 1 slowed to a hover to cut the whip antenna, something went horribly wrong. The hatch blew off to skip along the waves like a stone. Unsecured, Liberty Bell 7 immediately began to take on water. At this point, Grissom had unplugged himself from the capsule and rolled out into the sea. The US Navy designed Mark IV pressure suit was designed to be watertight to allow the astronaut to float. However, in his haste, Grissom had left a connection valve open. This let water begin to flood his silver suit, which acted as an anchor in his body. As Grissom struggled with the sea, Hunt Club 1 was able to latch onto the foundering Liberty Bell. Unfortunately, the seahorse wasn't equipped to handle the weight of a 4,000 pound sea anchor weighing it down, and it too was almost lost as the recovery cable snapped taut, pulling the marine helicopter into the water. Lewis fought hard, lifting the waterlogged spacecraft out of the water, but every time it seemed as though the battle was over, a wave would swamp the open hatch and drag it back down. The overloaded engine of the seahorse choked as metal shavings entered the oil system. Lewis feared not just losing Hunt Club 1, but the thought of the helicopter crashing down onto the struggling astronaut. 
Meanwhile, a second Hunt Club helicopter dropped a horse collar to Grissom, who was pulled to safety. Hunt Club 1, with his engine screaming, prompted Lewis to order the recovery cable severed. Liberty Bell 7 was cut from the seahorse. Liberty Bell 7, despite being a spacecraft made for flying outside of the atmosphere, met a similar fate to the Titanic, having been swallowed by the Atlantic Ocean. It was suggested that Grissom, having survived the ordeal, punched out too early before Hunt Club was able to connect. Gus and his astronaut brethren scoffed at such suggestions. Fellow pilot Wally Shira tested the explosive hatch after his mission on Sigma 7, which produced a deep bruise on his wrist from the explosive plunger's recoil. Gus had no such markings on his body. So if Grissom didn't engage the hatch, then what caused the accident? Many theories abound. One of the 70 explosive bolts on the hatch was found to be faulty, but it was left in place. However, it's very unlikely that this was at fault. A more likely scenario is that static electricity arced from the helicopter as they attempted to lash onto Liberty Bell. This would have triggered the explosives in the hatch and fired it. A concrete reason has never really been found, even to this day, and Liberty Bell lay in the depths of the Atlantic, in darkness. 38 years later, in 1999, an expedition led by Kurt Newport discovered the resting place of Liberty Bell. Deeper than the Titanic, the Mercury craft lay right side up, no doubt a result of the anchor-like landing bag. Despite the loss of a remote-operated vehicle in rough seas, on July 20th, 1999, exactly 30 years to the day that Apollo 11 landed on the moon, Liberty Bell 7 was pulled from the sea. NASA pad crewman and former Luftwaffe night fighter flight engineer Gunter Vent was present, laying eyes on the craft 38 years since he last saw it. Jim Lewis, the helicopter pilot who almost saved Liberty Bell, was also present. The one man who should have been there, though, to see the recovery wasn't. Grissom had perished 29 years prior in the Apollo 1 accident, which also claimed the lives of Ed White and Roger Chaffee. An ironic twist of fate is that the Apollo spacecraft had an intricate hatch which lacked any quick release system. This trapped the trio inside as a fire spark in the pure oxygen environment. It was over for them in less than 14 seconds. Liberty Bell 7, having undergone an extensive restoration procedure, now lies in the Cosmosphere in Hutchinson, Kansas for all to see. Despite being underwater for 38 years, it was actually really well preserved and only shows minor damage. Before the 1999 recovery, Kodak, the manufacturer of the pilot observation camera, held the belief that the film that captured Grissom's flight could be recovered as well and shed life on the accident. Unfortunately, this idea was quickly dispelled as the film canister had burst deep underwater, ruining any hope for any concrete evidence. I do want to make one final addition here. In 1983, the film The Right Stuff depicted the loss of Liberty Bell 7. I personally want to speak out on this depiction of Grissom as played by Fred Ward. In the scene, Gus is depicted as having a near panic attack and losing his cool. This heavily contrasts the calm and collected Grissom in real life, who was a true professional on and off the radio. Many today believe that if his life wasn't claimed in the Apollo 1 accident, Grissom would have been among the first on the moon. And despite having never gone to the moon himself, Gus is up there. On the moon's far side, a crater was named for the man who devoted his life to the stars, Grissom Crater. Thank you all for watching this video on a topic near and dear to me. It seems almost yesterday that I watched the Discovery Channel's Search for Liberty Bell 7 documentary that detailed the recovery efforts that would bring Grissom's lost craft to the surface. I urge you all to watch this doc in full. I also want to thank Hellion for the art assets in this video. As always, they really did turn out great. And finally, for the first time, a very special thanks to my patrons, whose support helps bankroll videos like this. It really does mean a lot and helps keep me motivated to keep pumping these out. For you at home, keep that sun on your back, guys. Have a good one.